This is the mission 43 in the space analog station about up that mart. And then today is uh, July 2nd, 2020. And we have the presentation of Varsha Shankar about the, the facility is the launch center. And then, yes, uh, Varsha, you are very welcome and congratulations for your presentation. And you are, you are welcome to start. Okay. Thanks so much, Silvio. Um, it's, it's a real privilege and an honor to be part of this mission. So this is mission 43. Um, and we are going to look at the launch center. Um, so I wanted to start here with um, the, the basic things that the launch center will need to be able to do. Um, the idea is that hopefully we can receive and we can launch uh, rockets from from this center to transport both goods and people. Um, ideally, you want uh, ships that are reusable and that can travel to and fro either between Earth or Mars, um, or in in some far future, like between um, the moons and Mars, if that if that affords a slightly more economical way to transport at like um, at quicker intervals. Um, so if you think about what the ship has to go through, it has to first launch from Earth with whatever materials Mars needs. So it has to escape Earth's gravity. Then it has to journey through space for about six to nine months, depending on which trajectory it's using. Then it has to descend through the Martian atmosphere. Um, if for some reason it needs to be stationed on Mars for a long period of time, it's, it will need to withstand radiation, low temperatures, and dust storms. And this includes everything that's part of the rocket, including uh, the, the fuel tanks, the nozzles, everything. Um, and because the launch window kind of opens only every 26 months, um, worst case scenario is that we absolutely need to be able to keep these rockets on, on the planet within the habitat for that period of time without consuming too much fuel. Um, and then, of course, these rockets will need to carry enough fuel on board to make at least two trips like from Earth to Mars and then maybe Mars and back. Um, and initial experiments will obviously be only with cargo. Um, there are a lot of like unsolved problems with regard to that as well. One of the things that I've pointed out here is the navigation system. Um, now, if it's going to be cargo, most likely you're not going to have humans at all that are going to and fro, which means it's going to need um, completely autonomous navigation. Um, closed loop guidance basically being that if something goes wrong during its navigation, it needs to be able to auto correct as opposed to um, open loop systems. Um, one concept that, that NASA is already talking about with respect to uh, any of the samples that Perseverance will collect once it's launched um, either July or August of this year is that it's going to have a fetch mission. So basically, um, uh, you're going to have, they, they call it a Mars ascent vehicle, uh, will kind of be launched from Earth, descend onto Mars, um, transfer all the sample that samples that Perseverance has collected, um, launch off of Mars, um, meet an Earth orbiter um, that's, all it, that's in orbit around Earth. It's going to then release the payload um, once it's uh, once it's a couple of feet um, next to the next to the orbiter, which means it's need to be it'll it will need to guide itself to the orbiter autonomously. Um, once it's released the payload, the orbiter will have a cone that kind of opens up and receives receives this payload. It will need sensors to detect that the payload is sufficiently uh, in constant side. It will need to close itself. Um, after which point it kind of, it, it figures out it what where the drop point needs to be and releases that capsule. Um, so the smaller challenges in there are how um, how should we think about uh, detecting when the payload is sufficiently inside the cone of the Earth orbiter? Um, does it need to be repositioned in order to make that journey down through Earth's atmosphere? There are theories that like if you're using um, like the equivalent of test tubes to calculate to to um, to carry samples, um, the top enclosure of that tube needs to be placed away from uh, the direction of descent um, in order to provide the most shielding. 
because um, you want those samples to be as properly preserved as possible. Um, I imagine that's going to be somewhat similar to what fragile cargo also looks like. Um, okay. Um, when I was when I was researching some of these uh, some of the fuel systems itself that could be used, um, the two options that came up. So the two ones that are most commonly used are solid and liquid fuel motors. So as an example, all the current Mars rovers, so Curiosity, Spirit, Opportunity, all of them use solid fuel motors. Um, and SpaceX rockets all use uh, liquid methane because they're much cheaper. Um, the, the excellent thing about solid fuel motors is that like they've been used very often before. We understand them. They're simple to employ again. The downside is that um, if, these, if these ships need to be stationed on Mars at any point, because Mars temperatures are so much lower, you're going to need to keep the entire system warm, which means you'll have to expend energy um, to store those rockets. Um, and the other thing is that they're single start in that, um, um, so think of it like a, like a can of petrol, right? Once you set it on fire, it will continue to burn through until it is stopped. Um, and this is because the solid and so the solid fuel and the oxidizer are all mixed into one entire entity. And this is not ideal if you want uh, complete closed loop guidance um, on any of these ships, or if you need to make slight maneuvers during, um, uh, during the journey itself, um, it's not ideal. So what's under investigation now is a hybrid motor. And as let's see if I can use my pointer here. use the laser pointer. Okay. Um, so the hybrid system is basically separating out the solid and the liquid components. Um, so the solid fuel being here, this is a waxy paraffin based uh, fuel, uh, which is really stable at low temperatures. So it's ideal to be like, ideal for like long haul journeys and also stability on Mars. Um, and the liquid fuel is over here. This is a combination of multiple nitrous oxides. Um, the technology is still under development. Um, it will allow you to have multiple starts by basically having, like the oxidizer gets injected into the solid fuel anytime. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the, 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 the oxidizer will get injected into the solid fuel anytime uh, you want an ignition to be restarted. Um, and the idea is that you can make much smaller, tiny maneuvers when you need to, um, just like tiny little thrusters. The other thing that's under development is uh, the nozzle. So, so this section of it um, is subjected to extremely high pressures. Um, during during landing and takeoff, um, and if you're if you're now wanting these these rockets to be reusable two three four times, um, work needs to go into what that nozzle uh, design should be. Um, one of the other challenges is that um, uh, achieving really high thrust with the hybrid system because injection of the oxidizer into the solid fuel means that the solid fuel is never quite at the right temperature that it needs to be to immediately start burning. Um, so achieving high thrust immediately is, is still an ongoing challenge. Okay. Um, and in terms of what I think we could possibly have uh, like set up for the main launch area um, is that like the main center um, over here is the receiving and the uh, and the departure platform for all of our ships. Um, the storage areas will become more clear in the next couple of slides, but basically methane and water could be produced um, and stored as offshoots. Um, the transportation center will uh, will take care of transporting any goods and materials that were either received at the launch center or any of these byproducts that are also produced nearby and um, transporting it to, to the other stations um, in the habitat. Um, traffic control and scheduling. Um, this is, of course, far in the future. But imagine a situation where you have multiple habitats on Mars. 
um, and there are many, many ships going to and fro between Earth and Mars. Uh, just like you have air traffic control on on Earth now to make sure that planes don't collide in midair, um, we'll start to have we'll have to start thinking about what that looks like for Mars too. Um, the kitchen and the relaxation areas for all the stuff that works in the launch center, um, and I've got a separate section here for uh, any robotic machinery uh, to be sheltered from radiation, from dust storms, small particles, and any maintenance that needs to happen. Um, I was thinking the launch center could look, could look kind of like a dome that opens up. Uh, so it opens up to receive and to and, and for departure of uh, of of, uh, of rockets, and then it kind of closes up once it's done. Um, the benefit being that you can build radiation shielding into the material here, and it also prevents like tiny dust particles from entering into the machinery. All the other centers could be. Um, regular 3D printed uh, materials that kind of look like these domes. Uh, it's um, um, and the shape is ideal to have multiple levels um, and gives you the most amount of space in the interior. Okay. Um, so some of the technologies that we'll need to think about developing um, to build the habitat. Um, if, 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 I think folks have already kind of gone over like you know the the fact that three D printing is going to be extremely important. I wanted to cover stuff that's slightly different and that we'll need separately just for the launch center itself. Um, the idea of the landing pad itself. So when when you have a rocket taking off, um, the engine plumes basically this this portion of it. Um, comes at such a high speed and thrust that it creates cratering and it blows off dirt and dust into the atmosphere. Uh, if you remember the one of Curiosity's um, scientific instruments actually got damaged because of this plume exactly. Um, when we talk about more industrial size like launching and for cargo and for people, this is something that we absolutely have to avoid. Also, any cratering that may occur in the surface itself will, will mean that um, as these craters get deeper and deeper, every um, uh, every ship that tries to land would be destabilized. Um, so we absolutely do not want that. So a couple of options in terms of what we can do for the landing pad um, is really simply here. Um, you could have robots kind of lay down um, like a paved area, uh, which is somewhat heat resistant and able to um, withstand the high temperatures of, of an engine plume. This is an example of um, the Pisces robot. It's it's just laying down basalt plates, um, but you would need some other material on Mars, of course. Um, and I thought this idea was really, really cool. Um, this, is, um, this is an ongoing project in NASA from uh, Swampworks in Florida. And the idea is that towards the descent, when it uh, when the rocket is coming down for a descent, uh, the plume is actually uh, spitting out alumina, so, so aluminum oxide, um, really, really fast. So about 300 kgs is deposited in under 15 seconds. And because of the low temperature of of the of the uh, um, so of the of the ground on Mars, um, it cools almost immediately on impact. Um, leaving an alumina layer, uh, which can get cratered, but it will uh, it won't be to that extent as if you were just landing on direct rock, um, and there'll be next to no um, dirt and dust that gets blown up. Um, the other thing is fuel. Um, at some point, we need to start thinking about what fuel generation on Mars becomes itself, because we want to be almost autonomous. Um, so this is an ongoing project um, around having um, basically an excavator robot, so like digging robots. Um, and what you have here are, are wheels that, that have spikes on them. Um, and as they dig up regoliths, they get deposited in these two drums. Um, now, ideally, you want these like huge mining machines that you have on Earth, but A, transport is really, really difficult for them. 
and Mars's gravity doesn't really give you the benefit that large machinery on Earth has with Earth's gravity. So you need, so we need to be slightly smaller, like lower scale and closer to the ground to um, to utilize Mars's gravity itself for excavation. Um, the the teeth itself on the on the mining robots are really cool. Uh, right now, they've only been demonstrated to handle some amount of regolith that's mixed with with ice. But if we encounter larger chunks of ice, these teeth will actually break. Um, so we'll need to figure out what kind of teeth that we can have. So the idea is that this robot kind of mines. It picks up a whole bunch of regolith, fills it into the drum, um, and then it goes to a production facility. Which um, so it basically rotates now. So this this drum will now rotate in reverse, and it will. Uh, uh, basically, throw out all the regolith that it's um, that it's accumulated. It dumps it into the equivalent of a furnace, um, and I've mentioned that swarms are probably what we want here. Uh, so you don't want just one mining robot because that that's not really going to be fast enough. Um, so you so if these robots are really really tiny, you want a swarm of decentralized. Um, um, uh, swarms to actually pick up all of this regolith and kind of bring it in one by one. Again, swarm, swarm robotics are really cool. Again, an ongoing idea of research. Um, so from the regolith itself, you would extract water. The water can be electrolyzed into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, hydrogen is really important for us to keep because it is a source of fuel, but we don't want to store liquid hydrogen because it is um, you know, unstable and, and prone to blowing up. So we probably want to mix that in with carbon. Um, there is plenty of carbon on Mars itself. Um, plenty of it is present in the atmosphere. Uh, you combine it with carbon using uh, the Savitya reaction um, to, to capture it as methane. And that methane is what will be stored in one of those areas that I mentioned um, up above. Um, and for any facilities that would require oxygen and water, um, this would, uh, any of the produced materials would then be uh, transferred via an airlocked arm um, into containing cylinders and kind of moved over to the other uh, parts of the, um, of the station. And this is basically what this is. So here the methane would be stored. So that's why we need a separate storage area for methane or fuel. A separate storage area for water and the transportation would basically make sure that like we move from one facility to the other. Um, okay. Um, in terms of functionalities and what we can do, we'll be receiving ships uh, and preparing for departure. So this means we'll have to take care of everything from fueling up to maintaining equipment, scheduling a uh, launch and arrival. Um, traffic control and communicating with ground staff as to when um, ships are slated to arrive. Um, and if we have a dust storm like we have right now, um, you kind of need to make sure that uh, any of our robots, any of our ships are not out in, out in the wild. They need to be secured. Um, and this is also to make sure that we are building in contingency measures so that like, if a ship falls over, um, we have machinery to pull it back up. Otherwise, it's going to be stuck there forever. Um, logistics and transportation to move cargo to other parts of the habitat, um, maintaining the launch pad itself, which is going to be subjected to a lot of abuse, um, and the excavation of regolith to produce fuel and water. Um, in terms of duties that will be performed within the launch center, um, we'll need on-site engineers to, to maintain any of our equipment for fueling, for, uh, for our rockets and ships. Um, logistics and communication staff for all of our um, for all of our scheduling and traffic control, um, cargo delivery for uh, folks who are basically making sure that cargo delivery through the habitat is being organized and delivered, and robotics obviously who will maintain um, all of our robotics and machinery. The picture here is actually a picture of. Um, a swarm of mining robots that this company called Offworld is trying to build. Um, possible activities I've listed out are, you know, um, launch is extremely dangerous. Receipt is extremely dangerous. Um, we don't want 
uh, rockets carrying flammable fuel to combust and destroy the rest of the habitat. So we, we want to make sure that we have as many drills as possible to train people to deal with negative scenarios. Um, equipment and system monitoring needs to be done on a regular basis. Um, scheduling in advance for arrival and departure um, is going to be very important. Um, building up communication protocols, like what time are we going to communicate with ground staff? What kind of message format should they receive? Um, remember, like Earth to Mars, the delay in communication is going to be anywhere between four minutes to 24 minutes. Um, so if these communication protocols aren't set, um, we're going to miss out on valuable opportunity. And um, um, that could be potentially really damaging. Um, regular delivery runs of cargo around the um, around the habitat itself and transport of all of these materials, um, storage and monitoring of all of our fuel, making sure it's being stored at the right temperature. When we exceed capacity, we need to make sure that we start to use it. Um, and robot maintenance, sensor health, um, swapping out faulty components with spares. And if there's any recalibration or um, onboard navigation systems that need to be upgraded, those need to be done on a regular basis for all of our robotic machinery. Um, and guidelines for the other facilities, I think what the launch center could help with a lot is deciding what those communication protocols should be, because it's going to be mostly handled by the launch center. Um, and those could be really useful even to communicate between the various stations in the habitat. Um, of course, we won't have that kind of delay in communication, but it's great to have common protocols so that like words mean the same thing, times mean the same thing. Um, coordinating supply shortfalls um, and when equipment is required to be gathered from Earth and stuff is something that needs to be maintained. Again, like we said, like launch windows are every 26 months. And um, between those 26 months, we have to make sure that we're autonomous and like able to survive on our own. So all of this coordination is really important up front. And same thing for like spare part usage and replacement. And finally, possible activities that could be applied to our daily lives. Um, I've tried to make sure that we use a lot of materials that are available in situ um, at Mars itself. And having that as a principle for when we're developing um, technologies on Earth is really important. We use and adapt with uh, materials that are available around here. Um, Consuming the least amount of re resources required to accomplish the task, um, because resources are precious. And I think that that comes to light when we're on a, a kind of on our own on a planet like Mars. So maybe smaller, like maybe having a two-seater car instead of the six-seater car when you want to drive to work, because it's going to, only going to be you carpooling. Um, or even like when you're trying to move house, maybe get a truck that actually fits your house as opposed to like a grand industrial size. Um, attempting to minimize the impact of technology um, wherever you are um, so that you're not destroying the environment as you go ahead because um, there's only so much of like habitat that you have available to use. Um, the next one is around uh, swarms, actually. So if robotic machinery, instead of being like large industrial size machines that you typically associate robots with, if we can start to scale down, make smaller, lighter components that are modular and reconfigurable so that um, you can use the same robotic equipment, but in different configurations to accomplish different tasks, you are um, efficiently using resources. It means spare parts are going to be less of a problem. Um, and because you can do multiple different tasks, um, hopefully using reinforcement learning, um, you're able to deploy these swarms in different locations that are dangerous to human lives um, and hopefully make a difference on our planet too. And use local is just like, use materials that you have around you so that you're not, so that we aren't shipping things from across the world for, for, um, for let's say the lettuce that can be grown in Toronto as opposed to bringing it over from the United States. Um, it reduces fuel consumption and is generally good for the planet and doesn't contribute to climate change much. Um, and that's all I had.